been looking at uh, funding opportunities for archaeology. So, have any other questions um, around uh, um, the community archaeology is having reliance on heritage offering? Like what other sources of funding out there? And what kind of partnership working could we have to um, develop community archaeology and working with it? Um, so, funding opportunities. Uh, we have an awful lot, actually. Um, but I think you've got to work out what. Um, sort of project you're going for, whether it's management, or it's science and excavation. So there are different pots of money for different things. So we have uh, not just the uh, HLF, but we have um, other things like landfill and the aggregate levy, there's the health budgets, wealth and trust, there's development agencies that are looking at economic benefit to prove the value of archaeology. Um, there's also great big pots of money for wind farm developments as well. Um, there's um, through local authorities, you can get match funding. So if you get a, a pot of money from HLF, then you can go through the local authority to get um, match funding for the project. But there's also ward funding from local members. And I think one of the key sources of funding is actually working with your local members in your council to access uh, funding through the councils. So that's that bit. Um, what issues and hurdles um, did we come up with looking at uh, developing funding? I think the biggest issue is time, how long it takes to um, write applications, uh, work with your communities to develop projects. Um, there's also, as a local authority, uh, which many of us work or are on this table, there's restriction uh, on local authorities um, for what type of funding you can access. But we're often the first point of call for communities to come to, to access um, or ask for advice. Um, uh, too busy delivering projects to develop them. Um, capacity, I think, is one of the biggest issues um, for us when we're looking for funding. Um, there's also willingness for groups to engage with professional support and vice versa. And I think professional support, um, it should happen on a long-term basis, and that's where local authority archaeologists and local um, members are really important. Um, there's also issues with uh, sustainability um, and as we got, uh, ooh, how do groups fit in with wider pictures and managing their expectations as well and understanding. Um, sometimes uh, we need to provide advice in advance of funding bids, but often don't find out about this until after they've been written by a local community. So we think there is um, a lack of archaeologists advising uh, local HF boards as well. <coughs> the next one is philanthropy. So uh, could we get more people involved in a more philanthropic funding? That one first time. <laughs> um, um, if we access um, or engage with a wider range of people, uh, different uh, community groups, uh, different uh, range of people, um, hard to reach people, will there be more funding? Um, it's easier to go to the traditional audiences um, as they actually come to you um, and there seems to be a lack of uh, resources to pursue uh, funding um, and hard to reach groups as well. Um, we looked at requests, um, people die, <laughs> um, so there is money out there, you can tap into them. Uh, and I think uh, the way to do that is uh, we have to make archaeology uh, more worthy of um, you know, having uh, somebody want to leave us some money in their will. Um, and we can't be squeamish about that. Uh, the next section was uh, how do we suitably reward practitioners? Um, I think just success with community projects kind of helps you justify your existence uh, and then that is a big kind of cycle and you get more resources, uh, you get more publicity um, and we should stop apologising, we should value our expertise as well um, and we need, yeah, and there seems to be a role for the CBA and regional groups in facilitating discussions between local groups and professionals. Um, but I think one of the main points is actually having, you know, capacity at a local level, uh, long-term support for your community groups, 
and that sometimes doesn't come with short-term funding. It's something we're looking at to capacity at the end of the profession. Thank you. Okay, so we, had, we had a couple of questions here. Um, the first one was, do we need a common evaluation framework? And I think the general feeling was probably maybe not in terms of just a single evaluation framework. It may be very problematic trying to shoehorn the range of different uh, projects that we, that we have here into just one single um, evaluation standard. Um, actually, maybe what's needed is a range of common frameworks which would more accurately reflect, reflect the different types of projects um, out there. Um, one of the key questions, uh, one of the key points that was raised that we do need to make sure that these evaluations get used again, um, both for internal reflection on the successes and difficulties of, of individual projects, but also for longitudinal eval evaluation, um, perhaps by external organisations as well. Um, we also felt it was very important that initial planning of evaluation is built into a project right from the outset. Um, but that it does need to be dynamic um, as the, uh, a, 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 a dynamic pro, uh, process that, that develops as the project continues. Um, and for an evaluation to be successful, it needs to be both quantitative and qualitative. Um, the, the second question um, is that do we think there's any mileage in adopting or adapting from the museum sector or from other national frameworks? Um, and actually, we felt as a group that museums do have, uh, there's a huge amount of work on evaluation uh, within the museum sector because so much has been focused on um, justifying funding. Um, there's a, there is therefore a wide range of experience and skills that we could potentially be tapping into in this regard. Um, but it does need to obviously build in a unique archaeological perspective. Um, and we also did what raise a question about why we are actually evaluating. Um, for example, in the museum sector, a lot of this evaluation is done for funding. Um, but another one is, of course, to ensure quality within the different um, projects. And there's often a perspective that really a lot of this evaluation is just for the sort of HLF uh, reporting of, of projects. Um, what we did wonder uh, is, is there any mechanism for feedback from the HLF? Um, concerning the evaluation process, perhaps similar to the kind of model that's recently been done by Natural England with a Changing Spaces programme. Um, and we sort of felt that we, did, we, we weren't aware if that, if that kind of internal structure was, was there to help um, promote evaluation from the HLF perspective. Um, and a thir uh, the third question was how, um, how would examples of best practice be disseminated to community archaeology groups? Um, we felt that this was uh, a very wide remit. It's very diff difficult to find a kind of co common denominator that will cover the, the, the different range of results. Um, we also questioned, we need to make sure that people can actually use these best practices, you know, examples or evaluation of results that are coming out of here. We often felt there needs to be a pressing sort of reason for people to actually adopt these kind of evaluation frameworks. And there's a real need for any work that's done in this area to be simple, comprehensible frameworks and appropriate, you know, delivered in appropriate content, uh, de appropriate to the, su the size of the different projects. And again, we, we felt that maybe there might be some potential here for the HLF to help uh, provide guidance in, in this respect. Um, but one of the key things, again, is that the methods that we choose really do need to be able to reflect the, 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 the range and complexity of the projects involved. Yeah, so we too were looking at uh, how we can evaluate and promote successful public engagement models in archaeology. Uh, so the first question, do we need a common evaluation framework for community archaeology projects? Yes, we decided. Uh, we do. How that manifests itself is a different issue, but um, we certainly felt there needed to be some form of uh, evaluation framework, although, uh, to be honest, it's quite nice to have one in professional archaeology too. <laughs> um, now what would the benefits of a common evaluation framework be? I think we can probably um, merge that with the fourth question, how would the examples of best practice and lessons learned be disseminated. This uh, took us in all sorts of different directions. Um, 
But I think one, one benefit that we saw from a common evaluation framework would be to help community archaeology groups with their project planning, with their application. If they focused on the outcomes as much as the process, then there would be, um, they, they'd find it easier to, uh, to, to, to put their projects together and hopefully attract funding. Um, there's also a benefit in terms of communication between groups. A lot of community archaeology groups don't really know what other, other groups are doing. Uh, there's no common framework of practice or sharing of results, and, uh, and that would be a considerable benefit, not just for them, but also um, for, the, for the discipline as a whole in terms of results. But we didn't focus just on results as being the major outcome of some of these groups and their activities. Some of them form simply because they want to be in a group and they want to be in a society, they want to meet other people with common interests. So the outcomes don't have to simply be results driven. We were quite clear on that point, I think. Um, and that has to be taken into account when you're evaluating a uh, community project. Um, another benefit would be um, a measure of consistency in approaches and methodologies, which would not be a bad thing. Again, probably in the professional sphere too. Um, and we also thought that um, the museums, in terms of the dissemination and the coordination of some of the results, museums should be nodes of expertise, local nodes of expertise and are very practiced in communicating with a wide audience. And the promotion of them as, as a sort of as hubs, if you like, around which some of these projects can revolve and their results should ultimately end up, uh, would, be, uh, would be useful. Uh, likewise, the CBA has more of a role to play in dissemination and coordination. Uh, the lessons learned and of uh, examples of best practice. There does need to be some way of sharing between groups, not just within community groups and across those groups, but between community groups and what we might term professional archaeology. Uh, and as you said, Mike, you know, partnership working is something that we're going to have to be focusing on. Finally, is there mileage in adopting models from the museum sector or other national frameworks? Uh, my experience, which I've shared with the rest of the table, is that the museum sort of um, generic social outcomes and general learning outcomes are actually quite restrictive. You end up trying to engineer the projects you really need to do into those terms of reference to try and get the funding. Uh, and so you, when you actually just want to do some collections, audits or something like that, you end up having to turn them into community sort of social projects that, which there are ways of doing, but, um, but it, it's a two-edged sword. We need something that is, is, is able to focus as much on, uh, on the results that we need as much as the practice uh, and the sort of less focused general learning outcome sort of things that, that aren't always helpful. Um, and also we thought that that sort of bureaucratic framework might put off a lot of community groups from actually bothering to apply in the first place. We need something that helps them to achieve what they want and helps archaeology to get what it needs, um, however that is. So uh, that's more or less where we ended up. We had a, a good, lively discussion on this table on the subject of training for volunteers and the provision of qualification uh, for volunteers. Uh, not least to ask, um, is there a need for it? Who wants it? Um, and who needs it? You know, because um, it might not just be you know the volunteer sector. And these things aren't mutually exclusive either uh, within the profession. Um, one of the first questions we addressed were the, uh, about you know, opportunities for providing training uh, to the volunteer sector. And 
it is not something that is coordinated um, nationally uh, in England and Wales or Scotland and is rather ad hoc in both its um, um, in, 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 in the nature of its delivery, because it tends to be rather project specific. Um, and then we ask, we look at the question, are there any obvious needs uh, which are not being met? And again, I think this is rather a, a project um, a specific uh, issue um, where volunteers are actually uh, involved in, in projects, it is normally because they actually want to be there. Um, we have been looking, I suppose, particularly at what we term um, traditional groups, um, that sort of age demographic, if you like, from sort of early retirement age, where people, uh, weekends and time is available. Uh, we did not address to the same extent um, the provision of training uh, within schools or colleges or youth groups who are in fact uh, a lot harder to reach. Um, and then we, we asked what training should actually provide. Well, I suppose ultimately it should be, it should provide a support. Um, it should help people to become self-motivated, uh, to build up their confidence and also to make them feel that their contributions uh, to the sector are in fact valid, worthwhile and would be recognised as such. Uh, which brings us on to the qualifications side of things. Um, who actually wants a qualification at the end of the day uh, within the volunteer sector? Well, it might well be that people who are volunteering as part of um, uh, a series of steps into moving into the profession, um, maybe as a career option, would see that form of volunteering and something like the, um, uh, the Barger uh, Skills Passport to be of use to them. But from our collective experience here, it seems that most of those people who are volunteering are volunteering because, as been pointed out uh, by yourself, that they're there because they like to be part of a group, they like to do something collectively and to be seen uh, to be part of that. But in terms of actually having uh, a certificate or a piece of paper, um, it, it is not a priority for them and it is not necessarily something that has been offered to them either in, in the past. And it could be by actually having uh, a more formal uh, structure, um, both within um, national organisations and um, contracting units to provide um, a sort of a skills base at a, a, you know, for a, at a very general level, um, building on particular opportunities for being involved uh, more directly, uh, that people would see that as an advantage. Um, So, of the three things that we addressed particularly, um, we were looking at the training, the skills, knowledge, and decided that both within the volunteer and the, and the uh, paid professional sector, that these should not be mutually exclusive. Um, that there is, in fact, um, a lack of uh, skills training also uh, at, the, at, the, at the bottom end of the profession, and maybe these things could be dovetailed so that people see the, um, the value of, of working uh, together um, so that that form of training would be sector led. Um, professional standards as qualifications and consistency is obviously quite important as well. Um, it's all very well, I think, people having a high level of uh, enthusiasm for doing things but at the end of the day, if something is going to make it into any one of the uh, national records, uh, monuments records, or in fact make it to publication standard, uh, then there does need to be uh, a, <coughs> a level of proficiency that we would all recognize. Um, and yes, it, uh, it is a way of the profession showing itself to be egalitarian. Um, 
I'm going to finish at that point because I think a lot of those points are going to be picked up again by the other table. Thank you. We were on the funding issues and hurdles. Uh, we've got three key points uh, diversity of funding sources, sustainability, and uh, working outside the sector. I'll just go a quick look at the first one diversity of funding sources. We heard at the other table there were a range of those, but we picked up on. Um, uh, uh, some others, uh, which includes obviously uh, within our own sector, both in terms of national community societies, county archaeology societies, our own organisations, whether they units or trusts, and resources that we can put into this. Uh, and issues of scale uh, around that sometimes just a small sum of money is usually from one source to partner up with a, a large grant from others, or even partnering up several sources together. Uh, European funding as a, as, a, as a possibility, TV funding. Crowdsource funding, um, paid opportunities uh, for participation in archaeology, uh, grants from other bodies, there are a whole number of massive bodies that are available to, to provide funding into uh, an historic environment sector, uh, funding from universities. Uh, and also, somewhere at the bottom line, we have state agencies, Story England, Canada, Story Scotland, they do still have some uh, money, despite the current austerity. These things all come with different strings attached, and that's one of the points that was I think, made on the table, that all these different sources require different levels of application, and then when you receive the funding, different ways of um, accounting for that uh, funding. And whilst one or two of the organisations around the table may have development officers, sort of collectively, I don't think any of us have um, uh, pure fundraisers, there was a feeling that archaeologists could do the fundraising themselves, but that's something we thought might be worthy of further um, thought. But there was also a feeling that archaeologists are the best people to um, sell ourselves, um, and that we perhaps we need to work out also what our unique selling points are, if we, we don't know those already. Increasingly, uh, however, then we see there's you know, good benefits for the sector itself, don't we? to have from uh, increasing local uh, engagement. On the sustainability issue, there's a concern that, of course, so much of the work is done on project based, so you go from one project to another project to another project. Uh, and also, the, the, of the diversity and scale of that, that, that funding. It's perhaps less easier to keep that sustainability of staff as you would, say, from commercial sort of archaeological work. I think that was the main issue about sustainability. But then again, if your staff change all the time, it's a different type of work because you want to have that sustainability with um, local networks within particular regions or, 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 or what other areas that you're working with. Um, but we did feel there was also some uh, scale and opportunity for working outside the sector and co-tailing onto, onto works done by other, other things. So, so, so home health and social well-being projects which involve going to the of lands in the countryside and you have a heritage dimension. We can provide the, you know, the professional expertise and support into those projects. So there's, over, there's opportunities there as well. Um, okay, so very uh, rapidly, we did discuss a lot of the same process, several other groups, just very, very quickly to uh, summarise some of the things we discussed. There's a difference between um, acknowledgement and qualification, the fact that there are different things and that different um, people will, will want different um, outcomes, whether some people or some people acknowledgement and a thousand of acknowledgement of what people have contributed is enough, or whether they want a certificate in the form of acknowledgement of the of the skills they've acquired. Um, we did discuss uh, what's out there already and sort of disconnect between some of the vocational um, options that people go down versus the, the academic routes and the importance of, of people feeling that there's a structure to work within that sort of progression uh, within qualifications. Um, we did talk about uh, some of the things that have already been discussed in terms of the age ranges of, of volunteers, that uh, the fact that there's people sort of age 16 to 25 and then the sort of 55 plus are two of our main groups of volunteers. And actually, um, whether those groups actually are interested in qualifications and differences between some of the qualifications and sort of the colleges and accreditation that those different groups are interested in, are they looking at working with people who might be looking for groups into archaeology? Are they looking for um, for uh, sort of work experience? And we actually sort of 
considered whether we're almost going back to the sort of 1970s days of the Manpower Services Commission in terms of um, picking up a gap in, in people's skills and for people to actually get into the profession, people who might not be in, in um, education or, or training or employment. Uh, we did consider whether we are actually as a, as a profession sending out jumbled messages. The whole thing of are we uh, simultaneously saying our college is for everyone, that everyone um, can have a role in, in, in it regardless of their background, but also pushing the um, skills and qualifications and accreditation side. Are we um, sort of, yes, sending out jumbled messages in terms of what people actually need to be involved as a, as a community or um, as, a, as a volunteer? Um, we, yeah, I did uh, decide that we really need to uh, develop a greater understanding of the different types of volunteers, the different demographics involved, and what we actually want. Um, the, the sort of option of achievement by, by stealth was, was raised in terms of people acquiring uh, skills and international occupational standards without um, actually formally going down a sort of qualifications route. And uh, we also looked at some of the um, various non academic routes as well that people can go down. Um, we did consider whether with some of the cuts that are going on, whether and the, the demise of adult learning and uh, things like the decline of some WEA things, whether we as a profession are sort of being um, looked at filling a gap um, that's, that's developing. And also the issue of us, uh, we, we are archaeologists, we're not necessarily volunteer managers or trainers ourselves, so um, it's a question of capacity and sustainability for us within the sector in terms of uh, delivering some of these things. Um, we did touch briefly on sort of evaluation of feedback as well in, in terms of um, giving uh, data back to some of our funders um, and whether it's worth looking actually at qualifications in volunteer management for, for some people who are closely involved in community archaeology. Again, we talked about sustainability and the importance of sustained contact and uh, keeping qualifications uh, up to date for volunteers. And um, uh, we did very briefly just at the end speak about, uh, in terms of our national option, whether sort of CIFA involvement is, is, is one way of looking at, at, at a national thing in terms of CIFA has always been clear about uh, non-professional archaeologists being welcome as, as individual members and whether uh, for groups and societies it might be interesting to see whether they could go down the, uh, the sort of registered organisation route in terms of recognising a level of skills and qualification at, uh, at a group level for, for community groups as well.